with tongues not too firmly pressed into cheeks. Channel Islanders are sometimes heard to say in wistful moments that, of course, England belongs to them. The idea is not outrageously fanciful, and to understand it, we must go back to the centuries leading up to 1204. The islands had formed part of Gaul, and thus became part of the Roman Empire as a result of the efforts of Julius Caesar between 58 and 50 BC. Christianity of a Celtic variety arrived in the islands in the 5th or 6th century. They existed quietly as outposts under the bishopric of Coutances when, in the 9th and 10th centuries, the Vikings did what they were really rather good at, namely raping and pillaging, with such success that in 911, by the Treaty of saint clair sur epte the King of the Franks, Charles the Simple, recognised Rollo, the Viking leader, as Duke of Normandy and granted to him the first of three large tracts of northwestern France. It seems that the last of those grants, made in 933, included the Channel Islands. The Dukes of Normandy were never happy to sit at home tending their sweet peas, and thus it was that in 1066, Duke William the Bastard, happily using the argument that the English crown had been offered to him by England's Edward the Confessor, expressed his displeasure by conquering the usurper Harold Godwinson at the Battle of Hastings. Thus, no doubt to their surprise, the islands found themselves to be part of the seedbed of one of the great empires of history, which had its zenith in the reign of Henry II who ruled over Western Europe from the Scottish border to very nearly the Mediterranean. Alas, King John was somewhat careless with his inheritance, and we see him giving up his claim to his continental empire to King Philip Auguste of France in 1204. Now we come to the clever bit. The Channel Islanders, wily then as now, somehow managed to persuade King John to grant privileges which have lasted to this day. Thus it was that the islands retained their own laws and customs which were based, for obvious reasons, on Norman law. One of the oddities of the jurisprudential basis of both bailiwicks was that their customary law followed that of Normandy, which itself was continuing to evolve judicially until the provinces of France ceased to be their own lawmakers with the advent of Napoleon's Code Civil at the end of the 18th century. Even to this day, the islands, although heavily anglicized and far too willing to ape UK law, however inappropriate or badly drafted, retain Norman law as the basis for their common law. Over the centuries, the privileges originally granted to the islands in the 13th century have been ratified in various royal charters. The seat of power reposed in the courts, but in the latter part of the 15th century, assemblies known as les États emerged, which were the precursors of today's states of Guernsey. Now, as then, the states are presided over by the senior judge. Until shortly after the Second World War, the courts held a considerable vestige of lawmaking power. In 1948, though, there came radical reform, manifested in the modern version of the states. So there we have it, an island which includes amongst its privileges autonomy, except in respect of its defense and external affairs, but which owes allegiance to England's monarch in right of her being a successor to the Duke of Normandy. The island stands as one of the remaining shards of land which at one time formed the western part of William the Conqueror's irresistible invader. The island has emerged as a liberal democracy which is not a member of the European Union and which has its own parliament, court and government. No constitutional overview of Guernsey, however brief, can fail to mention two of the other islands in the Bailiwick, namely Alderney and Sark. They too have their own parliaments and governments. There is fiscal union between Guernsey and Alderney, but that apart, it would be a very unwise Guernsey minister who tried to tell either of the other islands which side was up. Guernsey's economic history has been a roller coaster, which, fortunately, has had more ups than downs. It will surprise nobody that it had an agrarian economy until the 18th century. Suddenly, there was an equivalent of a gold rush, namely privateering 
thanks to a then benevolent Westminster government. Alas, such practice was brought to an end in 1856, but not before some of the island's magnificent houses were built and St. Peterport had taken on the hugely attractive aspect which remains to this day. By then, the quarrying of granite had become big business, much of it being used in the southeast of England in the construction of roads and bridges, supplanted during the first half of the 20th century by the export of tomatoes and by the highly lucrative horticultural industry in the 60s, which included the export of flowers. Well, an economic disaster happened. Not only did some countries in Europe exploit their weather, massively more agreeable than Guernsey's, by growing what we were growing, but without the need to resort to expensive greenhouse heating, but along came the 1970s oil crisis and soaring interest rates. The industry couldn't compete and has seen the acreage decline from its height in 1957 of 1,050 acres to that of today of 4.96 acres. It was just as well that the arrival of merchant bank Climate Benson in 1957 was a precursor of another industry, finance, which now includes fund administration, captive insurance, trust administration, and the professional services upon which they rely. And how then do we stand in relation to the rest of the world? Guernsey is autonomous, save in respect of its international representation and defense by the Crown. And I do mean the Crown, not the government at Westminster, which is also responsible for its overall governance. A funny old word that, given to a number of interpretations. Although islanders can hardly be described as revolutionary, there is a growing wish for the island to be rather more greatly respected as a mature and stable jurisdiction than at present by Westminster. And there are proposals in hand for Guernsey to have greater autonomy in legislating and expressing its own international identity. As to Europe, Guernsey is not a member, nor even an associate member, of the European Union. But it does have a special relationship with Europe under Protocol 3 to the UK's Treaty of Accession to the Treaty of Rome. It shares with Jersey a Brussels office and thereby keeps its ears very close to the ground. You never know when you might have to react to the European one-size-fits-all approach to life. At present, and one says this with fingers crossed, relations are on an even keel, well, sort of, and the European Union regards Guernsey as a cooperative jurisdiction. In the friendly rivalry which exists between Guernsey and Jersey, it's often remarked by Jerseymen that we are donkeys. We accept that with some pride. It is right to be stubborn, when not to be would inevitably result in the loss of our autonomy.